rather than answering my phone, I would uh, uh, rather give the floor now to uh, Markus Behm, one of our prolific researchers from the financial stability side of the ECB. Um, when we now go back to the forward-looking provisioning that we heard about already in the first session, but this time more recent and made more European. 20 minutes, Markus. Yes, thanks a lot uh, for having me here and thanks, thanks for the introduction. So I should say that this is joint work with uh, Cyril, who presented earlier today already on, on capital targets. Uh, uh, and of course, the usual disclaimer applies for us as well. So this is not necessarily the, the view of the ECB. Uh, yeah, the topic of this talk is uh, credit risk provisioning, similar to the, to the first paper that was presented today, as already indicated by Philip. Uh, and the motivation for this is both general and, and also specific. And the general motivation is that, of course, um, adequate and timely provisioning is very important for banks. So it, uh, it covers for expected losses. It makes sure that they can absorb shocks. And, and it also creates transparency for, for both for investors and also for supervisors. And the specific motivation for looking at this now is that it's been a very hotly debated topic uh, in recent years. So first during the pandemic, where initially there have been quite some concerns on, on possible pro-cyclical effects that could be induced by some accounting features. Uh, and then over time, the concern shifted more towards the adequacy of credit, credit risk provisioning. So in the, in the later stages of the pandemic, people got increasingly concerned whether provisions are adequate. And this also, this, this discussion strengthened then after the outbreak of war in Ukraine. Uh, so that's one of the issues that we want to uh, assess a bit in this paper, what, what has hap happened actually with provisions in recent years. And then the second specific motivation is that there is also a longer standing debate on accounting standards that dates back to the global financial crisis of 2008, uh, where uh, in fact the too little, too late provisioning of the previous incurred uh, loss accounting standard was argued to be one of the main drivers of procyclicality during that uh, during that crisis. And re in response to this, so-called expected credit loss standards have been implemented, including IFRS 9 uh, in Europe. Uh, and the idea of these standards was to tackle exactly this uh, procyclicality issues. Uh, and that's the second thing that we want to uh, investigate, how this has played out in the recent period. So I think you are all uh, more or less familiar with IFRS 9, so I don't want to go too much into detail here, but just to recap the, the, the core element, because this is really at the core of the paper. Uh, as I said, the main objective of this standard was to front load provisioning to earlier stages of the life of a loan. Uh, and this was precisely to avoid these large jumps in provisioning uh, at the time of default that have been observed in previous crises and that, that are illustrated by the reddish line here in, the, in, in this chart. So this shows the, the evolution of provisioning for a loan with deteriorating credit quality. And you can see that at the time of default, which is indicated by this red area at the, at the end, these loans exhibit sizable jumps in provisioning. And IFRS 9 was supposed to address this by uh, basing provisions on expected future credit losses so to avoid these jumps at the time of the vault and then avoid the corresponding procyclical consequences they might trigger. That's the theory of the standard. But then in practice, there have actually rather soon been discussions on whether certain features of this new approach might not themselves trigger procyclical effects as well. And this, uh, I mean, the most prominent that many of you probably have heard is the so-called cliff effect that could occur if exposures are moved to stage two at an early stage of the crisis. So you can see this here on the chart uh, by this, uh, in this blue line at the time when the, moon, uh, when, when, when the, when the low loan transitions from stage one, so performing status, to stage two, underperforming status. There's a switch in the provisioning uh, horizon under IFRS 9. Uh, it switches to life cycle expected credit losses and this triggers an increase in provisioning. That would, of course, put pressure on bank capital ratios, possibly at the worst possible moment. At the onset of a shock, banks might react by adjusting lending, and this would have procyclical implications. So to be clear, this is the same effect as under incurred loss uh, accounting. What differs is the timing. Uh, under incurred loss accounting, this happened rather late and potentially with a larger magnitude. 
an IRS 9, uh, this could happen earlier uh, and might also trigger prosecutorial effects. That's the first concern. And then the second relates to the usage of internal provisioning models. So under IFRS 9, banks are relying on their own internal models in order to estimate expected future credit losses. Uh, and there have been concerns early on that they might be tempted in order uh, to, to, to exploit this discretion that this gives to them, because this, this of course gives a lot of discretion in order to reduce provisioning needs and, and under estimate expected future losses in order to save on regulatory capital. So this is a bit similar to what has been observed also with internal ratings-based capital regulation, where also there has been a lot of discussion and, uh, uh, and, and, and also evidence that banks have been underestimating um, possible losses with this approach. So these are things that we want to investigate in this paper. And um, in order to do this, we focus on the period um, since 2018. So the period that was characterized by both the pandemic and the outbreak of war in Ukraine. And then we use a granular data set from the European Credit Register, so ANA Credit, uh, to see what has happened with provisioning dynamics during this period. And specifically, we compare provisioning dynamics for loans that are using IFRS 9 to those for loans that are using national accounting principles. Uh, so some banks in the euro area still use national accounting standards in order to report their provisions. Uh, these are mostly of an incurred loss nature. They also contain some forward-looking elements. Uh, but what's important for us is that they have been there for a long time. So they, they have been there well before the global financial crisis. So they offer a good group with, with whom we can control dynamics um, under the new standard. That's one of the cuts that we're looking at. And, and the second one is, is bank capitalization. So we also want to see whether dynamics for better and less capitalized banks are different. Uh, and the reason for that, or looking at that variable, is that um, less capitalized banks might have stronger incentives to be more lenient on provisioning, because of course, increasing provisions puts additional pressure on their capital ratios, and in order to, to avoid that, they, they might be tempted to, to delay or avoid provisioning. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we're looking at. Uh, and we use, as I said, this very granular data set that, that allows for sophisticated econometric uh, techniques, including a very granular set of fixed effects that ensures that we can look at provisions by different banks to the, uh, for, for, for loans to the same firm. So we can really systematically control for, for borrower risk, which of course greatly helps in terms of uh, identification. And before going into the details, let me briefly summarize the main findings. So what we see is that some features of IFRS 9 seem to be working as intended. We find higher ex-ante provisioning uh, as intended by the reform. So there is front loading of provisioning. Um, we also find a more risk sensitive reaction in response to shocks, uh, which is also an objective of the reform. But in terms of dynamics, we actually do not see so much differences between IFRS 9 and, and, and NGAP loans. So in particular, there's a sizable jump in provisioning uh, at the time of default under both standards. Uh, and we interpret this as suggesting that in terms of procyclicality, the implications uh, of IFRS 9 might actually be not so much different from, from that of previously existing NGAP standards, because the, as I show you, the dynamics are very similar. Um, and on bank capital, we also find that, that bank capital has a strong impact on provisioning practices. So we find that better capitalized banks generally provision more than less capitalized banks, which, which is what you would expect if capital management motives have a, have a strong role. And we also find that this tends to be stronger under uh, IFRS 9. So, uh, and this suggests, as I hinted before, that there might be more discretion under the new standard for banks to discretionary adjust provisions. Okay, that's it in a nutshell. Let me um, briefly um, talk about the results in a bit more detail. So I'll show you uh, three sets of regressions here. Um, first, uh, determinants of provisioning in the whole sample of loans, and then I'll focus on the dynamics. As I said, that uh, these will be particularly uh, relevant when it comes to deriving conclusions about procyclicality.
And here we look both at idiosyncratic credit risk events, so default events, and also at correlated credit events, so macroeconomic shocks, because these are, of course, particularly relevant when it comes to deriving macro conclusions. Well, let me start with a, with a whole sample of loans. So this is using the entire sample of 60 million um, quarterly loan observations that we have in the data set. And our baseline regression uh, simply regresses the provisioning uh, ratio at the bank firm quarter level uh, on the set of fixed effects and the number of bank and loan level um, variables of interest. So I'm showing only the ones that we are most interested in here on the slide. Uh, a dummy variable that indicates whether the loan is NGAP or IFRS accounted, and cap head, which is the capital headroom of the bank. So the, the capital space that is available on top of regulatory requirements. And what you can see here in the, in the first two columns is that, as I said uh, before, um, NGAP loans tend to have lower provisioning ratios for similar exposures to the same firm. So in other words, IFRS 9 has higher uh, provisioning, uh, and this is what was intended by the reform. Uh, and the second key finding that is shown in, in, in this uh, table is that capital headroom also has a significant impact on provisioning in the sense that better capitalized banks tend to provision more. And again, this is for the same firm in the same period, and we are also controlling for a large number of loan level variables uh, like maturity, uh, protection, uh, all things that are included in an accredit in order to ensure that these are really similar types of exposures. Uh, and you can also see that this effect is prevalent under both IFRS 9 and NGAP, so there is some discretion under both accounting uh, approaches. Okay, let me move to the, to the um, dynamics. Um, this is the, the main specification that, that we are estimating there. So here we focus on the sample of firms that defaulted during our sample period. And then we plot the evolution of provisioning ratios around this um, um, default event. And we do this in a regression uh, framework again, where we have the uh, provisioning ratio on the left-hand side, fixed effects on the right-hand side, and then interaction terms between dummy variables that indicate whether the loan is IFRS or NGAP, and the time to default. So default is uh, time zero here in this, uh, in this chart. And what you can see, I think, are three main messages. First, the message that IFRS 9 has higher provisioning pre-default is confirmed here. So the red line in, ahead of the default is always clearly above the blue line. The second message is that there is no real gradual increase in provisioning uh, for IFRS 9 loans. So if you remember the conceptual chart, we should have seen something like this. So uh, a gradual increase in provisioning towards the time uh, when the loan defaults. This is not happening. I mean, the line is rather flat and it's, it's evolving in parallel to the line for NGAP loans. So the bulk of provisioning for both types of approaches really continues to occur at the time of default of the loan. Um, and the, the last uh, finding is that there's a reversion in provisioning after default. So then here, uh, NGAP is above IFRS 9, and this is driven by less capitalized IFRS 9 banks in particular, as I'll show you in a minute. So yeah, I mean, overall, the patterns are quite similar between the accounting approaches, and um, this made us wonder what, what explains this? So why is there no bigger difference between the two approaches? And the reason for this is twofold. Uh, the first is that the timing of moving loans to stage two uh, varies across exposures and tends to occur rather late uh, before the default event. So you can see this illustrated here in the chart on the right, which shows the share of loans in different stages ahead of a default event. And what you can see is that, or actually what you can't see because there's my picture in front, but two quarters ahead of the uh, default, which is the second last uh, column, there is still 50% uh, of the loans um, in stage one. Uh, so these are all loans that default then. Uh, and one quarter ahead of uh, default, 35% of the loans are still in stage one. So this illustrates that it seems to be rather difficult for banks, maybe not surprisingly, to, to clearly identify those loans that will default. Uh, 
Uh, and this then explains why a lot of the provisioning still occurs at the time of the fault. That's one reason. And the second reason is that also the loans that are already in stage two exhibit some increase in provisioning before default, but still also for those loans, the bulk of adjustment continues to occur at the time of default. So overall, the change in provision, uh, provisioning patterns were, were quite similar between the two approaches. Uh, IFRS 9 did not fundamentally change the, the, the patterns. And what we think this shows is that it's really the incentives for banks that drive these patterns and not so much what exactly the accounting standard says. So also a model that moves to an expected credit loss approach uh, does not necessarily induce more timely provisioning if the underlying incentives for banks to delay loss recognition remain the same, uh, which is likely the case. Uh, and actually the built-in discretion under IFS 9 may even facilitate this type of, of uh, delay in loss recognition. And this is what we look at in the uh, second part of the paper when we look at uh, capital headroom. So here you see a similar uh, regression as before, uh, where this time instead of differentiating between IFRS 9 and NGAP, we differentiate between well and less capitalized banks. And the red line is for well capitalized banks, the blue line for less capitalized banks. And you can see that um, provisioning for well capitalized banks around a default event is always above that of uh, provisioning for, for less capitalized banks in line with capital management motors and uh, provisioning as much as you can afford strategy as we call it. Uh, and this effect is particularly pronounced uh, under IFRS 9. Uh, actually for NGAP, it's mostly statistically insignificant. We have some specifications where this becomes a bit stronger also with NGAP. So there is some discretion also under NGAP, but the effect is stronger for IFRS 9. So this approach seems to have enhanced discretion that is available to banks. Okay, I mean, in the interest of time, I can be very brief on this, just to say that uh, of course, banks have two levers in order to, um, to adjust provisioning needs under IFRS 9. One is to uh, yeah, adjust the ratio itself for a given uh, exposure in a specific credit risk stage. And then, of course, they also have flexibility in sorting exposures into stages because there are no fixed rules for that. So we also tested whether um, the likelihood of moving a loan to stage two depends on, on the level of capitalization. And this table shows you that it does. So we find that less capitalized banks are less likely to move exposures to uh, stage two. So they are using both of the levers that are available to them in order to, to reduce provisioning needs. Okay, and then the last finding that I quickly wanted to talk about is um, the change in provisioning around the energy price shock that occurred in 2022. Uh, so here we look at the change between the second and the first quarter uh, of 2022, and we regressed changes in provisioning on the same variables as before, and we also include an interaction term between our variables of interest and an energy exposure measure at the firm level. So this essentially calculates the degree to which a firm is dependent on energy price-related inputs. Um, uh, so the idea is that if you're more dependent on such inputs, then of course you're more affected by the energy price shock. And what you can see here um, in, the, in the table is that as, as the shock occurs, um, loans that are using the IFRS 9 uh, approach, for those loans, the provisions are adjusted in a more risk sensitive manner. So banks increase provisions more for loans to firms that are more affected by the shock. Um, and this is this risk sensitive reaction to shocks that was also one of the objectives of IFRS 9. And when we look at bank capital, we find that again, more capitalized banks increase provisioning across the board. So you can see this by looking at this, uh, at this uh, coefficient for the, for the standalone variable. So if you, have, if you can afford it, you, uh, afford it, you increase uh, provisions across the board. If you cannot, if you have less capital headroom, you adjust in, more, uh, in a more targeted manner um, and focus in particular on those exposures that are more affected by the, uh, by the energy price shock. So um, the exposures to more energy intense firm. And this is um, this coefficient here at the lower right of the table. <clears throat> 
Okay, then let me uh, conclude since time is up. So what, what, what we find in this paper is that IFRS 9 uh, has delivered partly on its objective of fostering more timely and prompter uh, provisioning. So we uh, indeed observe higher ex-ante precautionary provisioning as intended by the, by the reform. Uh, but in terms of dynamics, the bulk of provisioning, the bulk of the adjustment continues to, to occur at the time of default. Uh, which, as I said, suggests that in terms of procyclicality, maybe the implications are not that different for IFS 9 and, and NGAP. Uh, we also find that uh, there's evidence for, for capital management motors playing a strong role in provisioning, uh, and this is particularly strong under IFS 9. And we are not saying whether this is, I mean, we're not saying whether this is good or bad, because there can be good implications of this and there can be bad implications. If you think of the start of the pandemic, we actually told banks or supervisors told banks to use the discretion that is embedded in the IFRS 9 approach to avoid these significant uh, increases in provisioning, uh, precisely to avoid these procyclical effects. But over time, then, of course, there might be concerns about possible under-provisioning. Uh, and of course, also, if this happens too much, then it counters the transparency objective of IFRS 9. And lastly, on the, on, the diff, on, on, the, on the overall adequacy of current uh, provisions, so of course it's difficult to say whether they are adequate or not. Uh, we don't want to take a stance on that. But what we can say and what our findings suggest is that less capitalized banks might be at greater risk currently of being under-provisioned, um, be, be also because of built-in discretion that is offered by the IFS 9 approach. And that's it. So thanks a lot for the attention and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Das und Kassen ist Harry Heisinger from the Tilburg University. Uh, in order for the online participants to get prepared, I was reminded that you are warmly invited to also ask questions. So um, I'm willing to give the first question to somebody online. If you if you raise your hand or what is the approach to that? Hand or chat. So thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to discuss this uh, paper today. So. This paper is about provisioning by banks in the Eurozone after the introduction of IFRS 9 in 2018 that introduced a forward-looking provisioning in Europe. Now, some of the main findings that also I will discuss are as follows. So the authors find higher provisioning for banks that apply IFRS rather than NGAP, and they find higher provisioning for well-capitalized banks but lower provisioning for guaranteed loans. Now, overall, I think the paper is very interesting and very rich, but of course I have to have a few comments. So here are some comments. So one thing I'd like to discuss is the choice of banks, whether or not to adopt IFRS 9. The second issue is whether the relationship between provisioning and bank capital, whether it just reflect, reflects what the bank is doing, but or, or alternatively, it also reflects what the firm is doing which would complicate it. And then there's some policy issues that enter into the relationship between capitalization and provisioning, some of which I mentioned, some of them are not in the paper. So loan guarantees, the capital relief under IFRS for COVID, uh, under COVID period. Then there's supervisory expectations uh, for provisioning on, for MPLs, and there's a supervision by the ECB. Uh, it all enters, I think, the analysis. And then there's the issue of the, the timing of when a loan becomes uh, non-performing, which uh, enters, should enter the discussion of the overall timeliness of provisioning. So in terms of uh, the choice, so banks in principle, they can manipulate the choice, that is whether to be an IFRS bank or not, taking into account what it will do to their provisioning. Now, as the paper explains, some banks, and those tend to be the smaller banks, they can choose either to be an IFRS bank or a GAAP bank. But that immediately raises a puzzle because it seems to be that if you choose IFRS, you only have disadvantages because you have to pay or you have to have higher provisioning. That's what they find under IFRS. And also, uh, if you apply IFRS, it's more complicated and therefore more costly. So why would you ever choose IFRS? So this choice, I think, is unlike the analogous choice that we've seen in a different context where uh, banks have to choose between the advanced approaches versus standardized approaches 
and risk weighted calculation. But there, there is a real trade-off because the advanced approaches, they're more complicated and costly, but they do yield lower risk rates. So the same trade-off does not seem to appear here. So that does raise the question whether if you only look at the sample of banks that actually make this choice, is it still true that banks that choose IFRS have higher provisioning? It may not be true for this subsample. Also, I think, uh, given the analogy of the two uh, choice sets here, maybe the share of the advanced approach that you see in risk rate calculation could be used as an instrument to you know, predict whether a bank or not will use or apply IFRS and could be the alternative to the uh, propensity matching uh, score, propensity score matching approach, which is currently in the paper. Then I also wondered whether you can actually look at this issue of what IFRS 9 does to provisioning while sidestepping the issue of this uh, choice of the, the accounting standard. So one thing you can do is look at the uh, yeah, introduction of IFRS 9 in 2018, and you can look at the same bank before and after and see how the change in the regime affects provisioning. Another avenue might be to, to realize that for IFRS banks, after the introduction, they have this transition, transition period during which there is some capital relief. That is, they can add back to capital some of the increase in provisioning that comes from IFRS 9 relative to the previous alternative. Now, this suggests to me that banks during this transition period, they have to calculate provisioning under both IFRS 9 and the predecessor. So, so this would be supervisory information. So I don't know whether researchers have access to this. I don't know, don't know what the level of aggregation would be. That's just a thought. So then there's the question of what's the firm doing in all this. So essentially the paper looks at the relationship between bank capital and provisioning, but the firm may be active here as well. So there's a paper by Chantarelli and what they show is that in, in the case of Italian firms, firms are more eager to service their debt, which is debt uh, provided by uh, well-capitalized banks. And the rationale is that if you uh, keep paying uh, your money to well-capitalized banks, there's a high chance the bank will still be around. So in fact, you invest in the bank firm relationship. Now, some of this should be going on here as well, right? That uh, firms will repay more eagerly to well-capitalized banks. So if that's true, then also just uh, you know, having these uh, uh, firm time fixed effects, as in the paper following uh, Kwaji and Mian, is not sufficient to control fully for everything that concerns the firm, in particular here, firm behavior. Um, so the question is whether the data that the authors have, and I think the answer is yes, is uh, sufficient to actually try to sort out these two channels. Okay, so now the policy issues. The first is uh, loan guarantees during the COVID period. And the authors, they estimate a re negative relationship between there being a loan guarantee and provisioning. Now this is a bit surprising because there's other research, for instance, by Nicola, uh, that shows that banks, they tended to provide guaranteed loans to riskier firms. So that suggests that there should be positive relationship between whether you you know, there's a guarantee on the loan and the subsequent uh, provisioning. Well, the authors find here a negative relationship. So why do we find a negative relationship? So one reason, uh, if you look at uh, defaulted loans, uh, what could be driving it is the you know, supervisory expectations regarding uh, provisioning, which says that for, for secured loans, which include guaranteed loans, there uh, you can actually take seven years to do full provisioning. Well, for unsecured loans, you have to do it in two years. So that suggests less provisioning for defaulted guaranteed loans. Now, this does not apply to the non-defaulted loans. So then we still have a puzzle. And I wonder what's going on here is that the banks, they give these guarantees for loans to risky firms, and then they start evergreening these loans. Okay, so you provide guaranteed loans in order to secure the previous loans, and you keep doing this because you know in the end, you're going to get your money back from the government anyway. So I wonder whether you know, this is an explanation or could be looked at. Um, then there's the issue of capital relief, uh, which IFRS banks got during the COVID period. So connecting the first paper and the current paper in the sessions, uh, we know that uh, IFRS uh, here can be very pro-cyclical. 
So if a new crisis arrives, there's a lot of bad news. So if provisioning is forward-looking, you get a huge increase in provisioning and therefore a big reduction in capital. Now, during the COVID crisis, what we saw is that the regulators, they provided temporary capital relief only to IFRS banks and not to the GAAP banks. So the question is then is whether this type of capital relief, whether it's actually inherent in the selection of IFRS. So do we expect if there's a big crisis, we get this type of capital relief, which means it would be an integral part of all the relationships that are uh, looked at here. So IFRS adoption, provisioning, and capitalization. So that's a question which I throw out here. So uh, then the authors, they look at another shock. This is the, the second shock, which is the, the, the shock of the energy crisis. So the authors like this shock very much because it's a relatively small shock. So this shock was so small that it did not trigger uh, yeah, pref uh, preferential capital relief for IFRS banks. So that makes it interesting for the researcher, but of course less relevant because we only, you know, we more care about the bigger shocks, right? So that leaves me with one question in the room perhaps, and also for the authors. So how does, how big does a shock have to be to, uh, for the regulator to provide preferential capital relief to IFRS banks? I don't know whether the regulator knows this, whether they have a, a cutoff, but at least the COVID shock was big enough and, and the energy shock was not big enough, apparently. Okay, then that's the issue of supervisory expectations regarding provisioning, which I think does enter the relationship here that's being estimated. And as already mentioned, we have these supervisory expectations. They came from 2018. So then what they say is that for uh, unsecured loans, then the bank, they have to fully provision for a loan after default within two years. Well, that's extremely, that's what the, this policy was enacted after, you know, to get rid of the previous NPL crisis. Of course, this is a very stringent uh, requirement to fully provision within two years. So the question is whether it is binding, and I suspect it is binding, and whether it would be differentially binding for IFRS versus GAAP banks. But if it is binding, then yeah, you don't get the same relationship between capital, say, and provisioning that's being estimated in the paper. In fact, you know, economically, the relationship, you know, uh, the coefficient of capital should be zero because everything is driven by the regular requirement, and that's then you know, being estimated in the end. So the question is whether you know, these supervisory expectations, whether they leave a trace in the data. And I think that that can be looked at whether that's the case. Further, further issue regarding supervision is supervision by the ECB. So we know that the IFRS banks, they tend to be larger. So they're more likely to be directly supervised by the ECB. Now, uh, then the issue is whether the ECB is actually stricter and more diligent in uh, you know, triggering provisioning by banks. I don't know what the answer is, but if that's true, it could be that if you don't control for ECB supervision, you, know, you, you get a positive effect of the IFRS uh, regime, which actually should be attributed to ECB supervision. So final substantive issue for me to cover is uh, uh, the timing of the, the moment at which a, a loan becomes non-performing, because the whole issue here is the, the timeliness of provisioning. So what the authors do, they look at the dynamics of uh, provisioning around the moment of default, which I think is a part of the story. So another important part of the story then is when does the, you know, the default occur? And I think the reason to expect that the timing of the default will be uh, different under IFRS 9 versus GAAP. Uh, you know, we think that IFRS 9 is forward-looking, so you would take into account forward-looking information in addition to backward-looking information, which suggests that you would expect a you know, quicker uh, status of non-performance for loans under IFRS than under GAAP. So I think this would be an easy extension for the authors to look at, to also look when they look at time on this as an overall issue, to also look at the timing of when the loan becomes non-performing. Um, so then just to conclude, I think this is a nice, interesting paper from which we learn a lot about provisioning in the Eurozone, uh, but of course it raises new issues. So, Andreas, do we have a question from the online audience, or do they let us Un down? Unfortunately not. Okay. There are many people still out there. Wow, but and oh, here's one. I promised that they would give the first, yes. one, but then all the others are... Normally, we never pre-commit, but... <laughs> 
So I see we have many questions. I, so please ask your question we, shortly, briefly, concisely. We have a we have a, a question from Costas. A point similar to that made by the discussant about bank incentives. Do IFRS provisions at loan inceptions or early in their lifetime for loans that end up in stage three higher than those loans that remained performing? If the answer is negative, I guess that there are limited gains for the bank in IFRS. Okay, we collect. I, so maybe I make a tour. So we start with Vito, Constancio, and then it, uh, Jean Edouard. Thank you. Uh, Philip, you, at the beginning you, of the uh, discussion, you uh, stimulated us to compare this paper with the paper by uh, Jose Luis uh, Pedro, who is here, and he, he will speak uh, perhaps uh, better than myself about it. But nevertheless, I think that the conclusion of this paper is that there is no much difference in the procyclicality. But the procyclicality, as it is seen in this paper, is assessed practically only by looking to the moment when the provisions jump very much. And as indeed that moment is not so much different, or the amounts are not so much different at the time of default, then the conclusion uh, is that, uh, you know, they are very similar, so no more procyclical. But the analysis of the uh, uh, Jose Luis paper was totally different. It was about the impact on credit uh, behavior and its effects on the real economy. And that is not, uh, uh, so it's a different approach to the concept of procyclicality. And this is not done here. So we should not indeed conclude that uh, the uh, outcome or the takeaway of the two papers is different in what regards procyclicality because they are using two different concepts of procyclicality. Would you, and the question is, uh, had you the opportunity of also testing the effects on credit uh, and uh, what uh, in that case would uh, were the results? Thank you. Okay, let's continue uh, 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 collecting. Um, I, I'm afraid, Thank Andreas, you. there are so many questions, we would be slightly over time, but not too much. So, okay. Because I have to go all the way around that. <laughs> Okay, um, I, I like the um, I like the paper a lot. It's, I, I like the um, the empirical results. It's just a comment about how to interpret this. Because I will give you my interpretation. You can just tell me whether you agree or not. So I think the the point of IFRS in general has nothing to do with regulation. It's to give you know a better view to the creditors and the shareholders. And so it's logical that as we improve these accounting standards, they are going to reflect better and better the position of banks and they are going to be more and more procyclical. And so I think there is a temptation in regulation to try to go against this movement and I think we should not. What if we think that they become too procyclical, then we should have more countercyclical buffers and, and this kind of tools instead of tweaking accounting standards. And you know, one big tweak we have is in the way we treat hold to maturity securities and you know there is a big bank stock sell off in the US right as we speak and you know that's pretty much due to that so i think it's a very very interesting question in general you know this interaction between accounting standards and um, and regulation so that's just a comment for me thank you i wasn't sure who was next yeah Hi, Joseph Meichnisch from the Austrian Central Bank. Um, a quick one, you mentioned that banks uh, still have a lot of discretion at their hands when it comes to uh, stage two and three migration. And I was wondering whether the uh, same is true for countries. Did you have a look at the country effect? Because I remember when, when, when the pandemic first hit, we saw, we saw stage two migration just in a few countries. And I was wondering whether there is a strategic element to that and whether that was just a one-off thing or whether you've seen that in the data as a structural effect. Thanks. I saw Ernest and then, oh, we are a bit running out of time, unfortunately. You, you show the chart of 40% uh, of loans are actually recognized at the fault only at the end. Uh, so they had no provision before. So I was wondering if that chart is 
uh, before the COVID period or not? Because a COVID, or if this is a standard average number that comes up with, with, with the loans. Because at COVID, you might have a lot of firms defaulting all of a sudden, sudden debt. That's why, you know, banks, some firms, I don't know, because Anacredit is also small firms, a lot of small firms in Anacredit, micro firms. So yeah, if that chart was before COVID, after COVID, how these numbers change. Because 40% of recognized defaults at the end is, is a huge number. Sorry. I'll be super quick. Okay, the marginal cost will be low. <laughs> or the benefit be huge. Are there tax consequences of adopting IRFS 9? And if so, could you use that as an instrument for the choice whether to adopt it or not? Ari's coming. So, Payer, yeah. last one. So I, I was going to be very quick just on the point about lowering the risk weights for energy firms, right? That wasn't really the debate, right? The debate at the time, which is not, I think not, nobody in this room, just to be clear, is the commission wanted to possibly make more lenient rules for collateral posting to CCPs, right? So they wanted to make it easier for banks to give loans for posting to CCPs only. There was never any debate to lower the risk rates for loans or other things as such to energy firms, right? So, so that wasn't really, and, and I can say second comment, I think at the supervisory table, there was very little appetite, which was also reflected in a number of uh, statements made to the commission that, you know, please don't make this a banking problem when you've got bad energy firms, right? So I think just to make that, make that point, yeah. Okay, no, thanks a lot, uh, first of all, for the very good discussion and, and for all the uh, interest uh, and the questions in the paper. So I think we are very glad that there's so much interest. Um, let me pick up a couple of points. So maybe on the on the differences between IFRS 9 and NGAP, because some people ask questions about that. Uh, so indeed, uh, I mean, it's not completely free choice uh, whether or not a bank adopts IFRS 9. In fact, uh, if you're a publicly listed company, uh, then and for the highest level at uh, and, and reporting at the highest level of consolidation, then IFRS nine is mandatory, uh, and and only those um, operating at, at um, or that are not listed or um, uh, reporting at subconsolidated level um, can also choose to report under NGAP. So um, there is a choice here. Uh, there, there is uh, some selection definitely going on, and we we uh, address this in several ways. First by conducting a um, propensity score matching approach that, that ensures that the entities are still somewhat comparable. Uh, and then more importantly, in ANA credit, uh, there's also reporting um, by, the by, the, by the same bank uh, on different types of approaches. So um, if uh, a certain um, subconsolidated entity is part of a larger group that has adopted IFRS 9, there may still be occasions where that sub so a solo entity actually reports under um, under NGAP and under credit. So that offers us a nice chance to uh, focus on those banks that actually report under both uh, approaches um, in, in, in the data set, and then see whether our effects occur also for that subset of, uh, of firms in order to address this, this issue of choice. Because then we're looking at very similar banks and we find that uh, also in that subset actually there, there is still the same uh, pattern um, or the, the same findings emerge, essentially. On the IFRS 9 introduction, unfortunately, we, we cannot look at that because we, we do not have data before 2018. So on our credit starts only uh, in 2018. But I agree that on the tra transition, um, um, I mean, you're, you're right that, that essentially the banks need to calculate the provisions under both approaches. Uh, I, or we don't have this data, uh, if it's available somewhere here on the supervisory side, because we are on the financial stability side, there's always a bit of a data sharing problem. Um, so if it's here in this building somewhere and you, you are willing to share that with us, then uh, we would gladly look at that as, as well. Um, on the loan guarantees uh, and the negative, negative effect there, um, so maybe one, one of the reasons that could explain why we find something a bit different there is that we are also uh, looking at um, the same firm in the same period. So we include um, firm quarter fixed effects. So in that sense, I mean, you're right that um, banks might use guarantees more for loans to riskier firms, but then controlling for that and looking at the same firm um, 
I think it's plausible that you would then expect that, that, that those that use a, a guarantee um, might actually have lower provisioning um, attached to it. To it. Um, yeah, on the support measures, so that's um, that's also a key aspect, of course. Uh, so during the pandemic, there were actually two types of support measures. Um, banks were allowed to add back certain parts of the provisions to their capital ratios, uh, and there was supervisory guidance to be not too pro-cyclical in the assumptions used for the models. Um, and we thought a bit about this and uh, what, what this would do to, to, to the results and how it would affect the results. On the addbacks, it's actually a priori not clear how that would affect our results because it could also induce a bias in the other direction because if the banks know that they uh, can add back the provisions to their regular, regulatory capital, they might have additional incentives to provision more under IFRS 9, and this is not what we observe. For the guidance, this is not really, I mean, this didn't really constitute a challenge for us um, because essentially what supervisors have told banks was apply the standard. So they, they just have told them, look, there is a lot of discretion in IFRS 9. You don't have to increase it very strongly uh, um, after the shock. Uh, make use of that in order to avoid very positive increases. And, and um, so this is essentially the test that we are, uh, the, the, the thing that we are investigating. Uh, how this has uh, played out. Um, yeah, maybe just some questions on the uh, on uh, or some points on the questions from the audience. So on the comparison with the with the um, paper by uh, Jose um, Luis, I fully agree with you that um, it's a different thing. So um, the approach is different. The the country is different. Uh, also, this paper is not focused on IFRS nine uh, specifically. Um, therefore, and I also think that many of the findings are um, consistent. So both papers find a strong impact of bank capital, for example. Um, so therefore, I am um, not concerned at all. Um, looking at credit um, is indeed a, an interesting suggestion. So I think we will uh, we'll definitely do this. Um, I mean, we were anyway planning to do, do this for the period. Um, um, since the pandemic, what we cannot do is an, uh, do analysis like uh, Jose Luis, where we test the um, effects before and after because we don't have the before reform data. Um, okay, then there were a lot of uh, specific questions um, on country effects, whether we also looked at country effects, so we haven't done so um, for now, but it's also a good suggestion uh, on the on the share of exposure, so that was indeed um, for the whole sample of uh, of loans, so from the period uh, for the period from 2018 and, uh, and until 2023, but we don't find that this differs a lot. Um, and on the tax consequences, I don't uh, I don't know. I have to admit, um, but it's something that we can uh, that we can also look into. And finally, on it, on the energy uh, firms, so here the idea was not that we. Um, that we test for adjustments in risk weights, but more that um, the economic argument was that um, we would expect a stronger impact on expected future losses for firms that rely more on uh, energy-related inputs. So firms that purchase more from electricity or other energy-related sectors. Uh, so we would expect a stronger increase in provisions for these type of firms. And this is what, what indeed we observe for, for IFRS 9 loans. So I, yeah, would stop here. Thanks a lot for all the comments um, and happy to continue afterwards. <laughs>